I'm delighted to be joined by Oliver Gottlieb, Senior Process Specialist and SME of Oral Dosage, Solid Handling, API Synthesis and High Containment from International Specialist Pharma Engineering Company, NNE. Hello, Oliver, and welcome to the Pharma Tech Talks podcast. In this episode, we'll talk about current manufacturing trends and a focus on high containment, which I know is a an area of your expertise. Okay, let's get started by asking, uh, what would you say are some of the current process and equipment trends? Hey, Christian, thank you. Um, currently, I would say closed processing and continuous processing is one of the biggest, biggest trends I see, as well as automated processing. Um, and then a cooperation of everything where we have basically, for instance, say robotics in containment or in closed processing, basically also using single-use equipment within of this new technology or the robotics to avoid contamination, cross-contamination, or basically um, reduce the cleaning effort in areas. Okay. And what do you think are some of the, the best practices to consider when... Uh, when looking to design a, a high containment system or, a, or integrated process equipment? As a, at first, I would say that the pharma companies need to understand that they need a certain amount of containment. Uh, when we do implement containment, it should be fit for purpose for the right level of containment. Um, and then, of course, also look at the interfaces, the peripherals, the cleaning, the entire cycle, life cycle. Look at your utility system, your exhaust systems, your filter system. Do you segregate basically the technical areas as well when it's a contaminated or containment filter system that you can make a safe change with back in, back out. But if something happens, you still maybe have a secondary barrier as well as in your main process suite that you plan for a primary uh, containment as well as a secondary containment. We'll say here either closed processing or an isolator solution, but you're using also, let's say, an airlock or material airlock to generate um, a, a pressure or um, a cascade to avoid going straight into an open corridor. Okay, okay. And what about the operators? Do you find, you know, integrating the, the operators into that design? I know ergonomics is a, is a big thing. Um, is that is that how do you how do you sort of bring the operators in so it's a really usable system? Also, I personally think and would always prefer having operators on the project because they know what they do, how they do things, and they, due to ergonomics, can tell you, oh, this works, this doesn't work, or for instance, on an isolator mock-up, no, this doesn't work, we need to move this. I think it's paramount involving all the operators into this design process. Uh, me, as an engineer, can design whatever, but as the operator comes, no, it doesn't work, it doesn't help really. So you need really 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 a lot of help of the operators and the organization behind them to acknowledge and to understand and come along on that process that you can actually achieve um, a very good containment solution or containment project so it's a real sort of team effort i guess when you're, when you're pulling a system together it's not just one designer sat away coming up with a solution it has to involve involve the whole uh, exactly. uh, organization really Actually, I totally agree. Um, I'm having a couple of those kind of projects running right now. And you can see where you have the highest involvement of operators. These are the projects they run smoothest compared to where you only have some project managers and engineers. So it is a huge benefit having the people with the daily operation by hand and basically guiding you as well what and how they do things and that you can translate that into a design with the manufacturer of the containment equipment. Let it be an isolator, let it be split butterfly webs, let it be single-use bags, let it be also the room itself. They need to know how they move through the room, how they bring things into the room, uh, how they dock something on a machine. Do they need a lifting aid and, and basically how to get rid of waste. All these operations, including operators and, and the design around everything, when, when they tell you how they do it, is much easier for a project or a design engineer to understand what is actually required. So I would say it's paramount to use them. Yeah, yeah. And you talked earlier about, you know, uh, lifting and material handling. You know, sometimes we focus on 
the isolator or, or the, the split butterfly as the containment connection. But how, how does the sort of the material handling come into this? I know you mentioned closed processing being being one of the trends, but the, obviously containers and things like that need to move around the process, don't they? Yeah, it is very, very important. Um, you need lifting aids and so on. For my uh, case, for instance, I live in the Nordics in Scandinavia, specifically in Denmark. We have very strict rules by the government, by the work authorities to not overwork or not heavy lift uh, work operations or repeating work operations. So we have, for instance, limits of 10, 12 kilos of total weight of canisters uh, when you dock them to a reactor or you want to lift them or take them away. And then it's also depending if it's on a, you stretch your arm away, uh, it's shoulder away or if it's on closed body. And then also the repetition, how often do you do this movement per day? So I had a case where we were not operate allowed to operate more than five kilos in a container, including the container and the split butterfly web. So you see a uh, wow. container and split butterfly wealth was basically not possible because we exceeded already the well, uh, the weight. So we needed to find yeah. a single-use yeah. solution because there we saved basically four kilos because uh, roughly the bag and the single-use split butterfly wealth had roughly one kilo. Otherwise, we could have not have operated at all. So it is um, important to look at the overall workload in, in the load sense of what you need to carry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you mentioned something there about the weight and, and this sort of leads on to one of the, the next questions, really about some of the predictions that you have for, for process equipment and how you see that impacting and what, what changes is it going to bring about for the, the biopharma and pharmaceutical industry? As I can see it currently, it is a, it's a trend that we use more and more robotics uh, out of two reasons. Uh, number one reason is basically the containment part. We want to eliminate basically the operators out of the process room. Uh, some of the processes you can simply not fully contain sometimes, and then you need a robot and so on, and then you only have the cleaning effort, and then the people have to have uh, full PPE. Um, and the next thing is, as said, the problem with the operator having to lift heavy weights all the time and you want to avoid that. And that is why the robots are also required, uh, especially when you consider weighing, dispensing uh, tasks, um, different um, products come in in different bags or containers and then come in a standard container and the robot can actually hand it and add it to your process. So this is something I can... Here, especially in the Nordic Sea, a clearly trend. It's an expensive trend, but it's also a necessary trend in some cases. But it is something in the last 15 months that is increasing significantly. And what do you say? Is that geographically, you said there in the in the Nordic no. countries, you, you, you're no, seeing no, that. No. But is that is that something that's happening across, across the globe? Or is it focused in certain areas, certain products? I, especially in the containment area, I can see it a lot also in Switzerland, Germany and so on, also let's say Europe, also in France and so on. So in, in general in Europe, it's a, it's a common thing you can see. I have not seen it so much in the US. And then again, I'm not doing too many US projects recently. It's only two, three. But um, the majority of my work, Asia and, and Europe, I see Asia is not doing these uh, automated operations yet. Labor is cheap, and then again, work labor force uh, law is not as stringent as in Europe. So I see here in Europe, it is in generally a thing, especially big pharma is implementing a lot because they also want to reduce the human error factor and 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 the containment, and then basically this is the way out of it. And do you think maybe the the potency of some of these drugs we're seeing? You know, we were very comfortable handling OEB4, OEB5, but now we're seeing OEB6 and 7, you know, and going into some really, um, really dangerous materials to handle. You know, the, the, the one microgram uh, and 100 nanograms and 10 nanograms is now becoming quite commonplace. Um, do, you see, do you see that impacting on the automation side of things? Um, yes and no. Um, I'm running myself 100 nano, 10 nanogram project currently and there we have not uh, isolators involved. But we found uh, primary containment uh, that is basically very effective in small scale. Small scale set. Uh, I can personally not see large scale projects currently running with uh, 10 or 50 nanogram products. 
Um, maybe on the API manufacturing, but I don't know how they handle it. And I assume due to the size of the equipment, they would rather choose the PPE approach, what is still legal, uh, because huge equipment to contain is sometimes uh, not possible. And then you contain more the room and then uh, you have like a mist shower and, and, and use the uh, personal protection uh, as your containment barrier. Still using a closed process, um, preferable. <laughs> Of course, of course, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's definitely something that's become more prevalent, isn't it? Closing the processes wherever wherever possible. Um, and what would you say are some of the common issues that you come across uh, regarding containment equipment, um, and and how do you go about addressing these? I think the biggest factor is basically containment awareness. Um, I must admit. Strange enough, a lot of companies do not acknowledge the requirement of containment equipment, even though they have high potent products and so on. And then a lot of companies downplay actually the, the, the requirement or the demand for it because, yeah, but we never had an accident or usually nothing happens. But when you look at the material data sheets, you look like, so, uh, no, you should have a serious containment strategy. You should have the proper equipment. I can see it often basically that uh, companies are not using equipments for its intended purpose. Let's say you use in tabletting a tablet machine that is not meant for potent products. Uh, you should not apply it because you have too high emissions out of the machine and then the cleaning aspect as well. So, and, and basically what you ask is basically the awareness in the pharma, a lot of pharmaceutical companies is not present. So I try basically to, to raise the awareness, to, to, to bring it up, to, to moderate uh, in sort of a workshop and I use or usually also small vials or for contamination or migration I do some little tricks like I take a UV tracer on my hands when everybody comes in shake hands and then when I talk about product migration when everybody's like no no we don't have that I take out my black light my UV light and say okay let's talk about that look at your hands your face and then you see them glowing a little bit with powders so basically using some some psychological tricks sometimes or having little HPLC wilds and giving the OEL OAB range what they are working in and saying this is the amount that is allowed to come out in eight hours out of your equipment in your process room and then they are shocked what is actually allowed so I basically dispense this amount of salt or, or icing sugar into these little vials, specifically for clients sometimes. And then basically I shock them because I've seen the process rooms. I said, this is what is allowed to come out of you or be present in your room. And uh, now remember how much you really have. So it's, I, 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 I try to, to hit them in a psychological effect and basically bring the awareness and what is the reality as a, I'm giving them a reality check sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd say the education is one of the, one of the biggest challenges then is, is getting is, that yeah. awareness. awareness exactly. out there. Yeah, exactly. That they understand what is really needed and what is actually required. I would rather say, because OEB one, two, three, three, already you need to start to be more careful. Then again, how much do you work? Is it small scale, large scale laboratory? But from a three, I would say you should definitely consider more and more containment equipment. And four, five, six, you definitely need to have a, a really thought through strategy that really ensures the safety of your, not only the people, it's also your facility and your, your products because you don't want to have in these micro or nanogram levels uh, product migration or cross contamination, especially let's talk cytotoxic. Suddenly, you have another cytotoxic in your uh, other product because you have a carryover, and because the old standard carryover routes are too high. So basically, it's a mixture of everything to avoid uh, any kind of emission or to reduce the emission, and also having the right um, protection for the people, process, facility. And do you find, you know, you mentioned there about cross-contamination, do you find that people are looking more at dedicated facilities or still trying to be a little bit flexible uh, and having multi-products, which does present the risk of, of, of crossover? And so for my case, what I'm working on, I must say, we have the multi-purpose product facilities. Um, it's, it's really seldom I have in the last five years not have a single single purpose or mono facility. I had only multi-purpose facilities. Sometimes the approach in a multi-purpose facility is though that you still dedicate certain equipments B 
because of the stringent uh, requirements or let's say you have a hormone with an OEB6 and then you want to be sure even though you clean thorough you have done the swapping and so on but just out of rationals you want to ensure basically nope we are not taking any risk we have this part of equipment is dedicated to this product. So it's it's a mixture. The facility is multipurpose. A lot of equipment is multipurpose, but certain parts can be dedicated. And do you see more uh, emphasis on cleaning these days? Um, you know, we, we, the, the, there is the, the argument about single use technology where the cleaning is, is negated, but, but where cleaning is required, um, has that, has that changed? Has that evolved at all? Um, I think it's two things. Where it is required, people look better on how to clean. Uh, and did they properly clean? Did they clean with the proper agents as well? I recently had some cases where we actually needed to change the company SOPs and cleaning agents because the product group was identical, but not each product could be cleaned with the same agent. So they needed to adapt to each uh single API with an with the cleaning agent at the end. But then again, said that, uh, if I run projects, I actually try to eliminate that cleaning effect. For instance, for transfer of uh, product, I would personally always nowadays try to avoid stainless steel flaps and also double split butterfly webs and stainless steel containers. I personally promote pretty much in my projects to go single use. Simple calculation I would say is when you consider you need to make a cleaning validation, you need to revalidate a year, the amount of water, the handling, um, then even the bag for let's say 150 euros including wealth is not really the big deal, then still you need to incinerate the bag as special uh, waste. But considering CO2, maybe you have also partly a concern that plastics or single use have a higher CO2 footprint. But then again, you need also to consider the water consumption. You need uh, soft and portable water. You need purified water for the final rinse to generate that water. So we are basically using a uh, human necessary resource for a, a purpose, I would say, that is not required. Considering we only have the amount X of water globally available, I think we should emphasize more on single use and then basically also look on approaches. A lot of companies do the CO2 footprint. How do we recover CO2 and so on? Also put money into technologies to, to invent, to recover CO2 or to convert CO2. So for me, a big driver, a big a pro speaker for single use because of eliminating storage space, handling, water consumption, revalidation, cost of uh, equipment, cost of piping, cost of... Uh, I mean, when you work cytotoxics and you need to uh, incinerate 10 cubic meter of water, that's a very unfavorable mass balance or energy balance, I would say. I would try to avoid these kind of things. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's an interesting comment because a lot of people look at single use and think you're throwing something away it's not good for the environment, but there's a lot more factors in there, exactly. isn't there, than just the fact that you're throwing it away. There's the consumption to the, you know, the washing and cleaning side of things, exactly. the, the repetition that you have in there. Exactly. I would say it's not only about CO2 or energy. It's basically about the entire thing you need to look upon. And as said, Water is a human necessary resource. We need that. And if we use it to, to clean something we could avoid to clean, I would say save the water. Absolutely. Absolutely. And do you uh, have any thoughts on, I know we touched upon automation, um, but how do you see that impacting the, the industry as we go forward? Yeah, well, as mentioned, also with the robotics, I think it is increasing and it also has the benefit that basically you ensure more safe production. So this is a multi-layer thing. What is automated production it can be only a laser scanner. You use the safe, uh, the same or the right bag adding to your process or basically a fully automated plan where you have robotics and no human interference and so on. And I think with the requirements from the authorities more and more going to close processing, protecting the operators, protecting the facilities and the environment, avoid cross-contamination, and also looking upon that you can do best by avoiding error having automated and validated processes. That would basically benefit increasing the automation demand. 
or the automation impact or use of automation within our processes and so on. And said that, I know also that there are some restrictions or problems or challenges using all this because, for instance, let's take a single-use bag. A bag is very soft uh, to handle. A bag is uh, something that is uh, for robots partly difficult because they are transparent. There are now suppliers who can do it better, but in general, uh, the form factor of a bag that collapses or also the collar is until now a huge challenge for all those suppliers as far as I know. So you'd be looking for something that's still light, still lightweight, but rigid would be harder, would be easier to, to manage for the, for the robotics uh, um, automations. Yes and no. I know that there are a few companies working on the solutions, basically, um, like yourself, you can do frames, three-dimensional bags that have the shape of containers and so on. That could be a benefit, but then you need the auxiliary equipment as the frame and so on to, to help it. That is one solution. The other solution is basically, on the other hand, making the robots more versatile and learning more about how can I grab it a different a handling tool and also the optics need to be adapted. As said, uh, transparent foils is uh, sort of a challenge right now for the optical eye yeah, of, a, yeah. of a robot arm. So, but it's uh, we are getting there. Yeah. It's a challenge, but I think I think the industry will, they have solutions will overcome it. Too. Yeah, they they are working on it. I know it. Uh, I, I heard it. So yeah, it's uh, on the way. But I think we are two three years out. Then we will see more and more solutions also for this. I'm myself participating on some projects where we try how can it be done? How can we uh, streamline uh, single use, including robotics and so on? Um, but I don't see it happening within the next 24 months or 36 months to be implemented properly. They are due yeah. to some challenges, but it's, I am, I'm confident it's coming. It's coming, definitely. Yeah. And when you see uh, robotics, a lot of people just associate the robotics with the arm itself and picking and placing uh, objects. Um, but do you, do you see the movement of material, things like AVGs coming into that, that, that sphere as well? That I see actually is uh, in extremely a lot happening now. Um, I have myself some projects and this is basically, you see these uh, automated, it's not guided vehicles, they are programmed more and have cameras and so on. The old ones, they had like the metal pins always in the floor. You don't need that anymore. You have these computer controlled and with an optic. So they drive. And um, since uh, I would say four or five years, it's basically increasing uh, in the raw material handling from warehouse to warehouse, internal transfers and so on and so on. You can even have some fully automated forklifts and so on, uh, where you have entire pallets on it, not only small goods. So the variation of small and, and, and large transport is definitely given and coming more and more. And I think it will actually come also more. Um, we in our company here, we do significant um, changes to our previous thoughts or project execution by implementing these kind of technologies. Excellent. Well, some really interesting thoughts mm -hmm. there, uh, Oliver. Do you have any sort of final thoughts that you'd like to leave us, leave us with or final comments? Well, yeah. Also, looking at all our industry, I would say um, it's important that we raise our so we raise the awareness at the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical manufacturers about the fact of containment or the requirement of containment, how it's properly implemented, and then also look into using basically a different approach than 10, 15 years ago. Go away maybe from stainless steel, go to single use where applicable, where possible, as well as thinking maybe the process is new, keep the processes closed, keep them contained, keep, and most of all, keep your operators safe. For me, it's paramount, keep your operators safe. I think this is uh, the most important parts and issues I would address within the industry. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Oliver, for your time today. I'm sure the listeners have found this, uh, this really interesting, the insights that you've given us. Um, if, if the listeners need to find out a little bit more about NNE, where, where would they go to, to find this? As a, we have a homepage, nne.com, um, uh, or on LinkedIn, you can write NNE. 
So we are present. I mean, we are close to 2,000 engineers servicing life science and um, pharmaceuticals. And yeah, we are one of the big players only working on that one. So internet is the source. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Oliver. It's been really interesting. Likewise, Christian. Thank you. Thank you.